bhavavatu sahanau bhunaktu sahavir karavavahai tejasvi navadhi tamastu mavid vishadahai aum shanti 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 Namaste. So after the last couple of videos, <laughs> if there's anybody still watching, um, of course, I have only continued my deep studies of Vedanta and Upanishads. And I've come up against something really interesting. Well, it's all really interesting, but as far as the practice of Vedanta, the original uh, meditations through which people realized Brahman are known as Upasanas or Vidya. So Upasana means worship and Vidya means knowledge. The history of it goes back to the original Vedic sacrifices. Now these are given in the Rik Veda and Sama and Atarva Veda, Yajur Veda and so on. And they are explained in uh, esoteric sections of the Vedas called Brahmanas. And then the Upanishads explain the esoteric meaning of the Brahmanas. So it's pretty darn esoteric. But in the beginning, there were the sacrifices alone. In other words, there were no meditations required. Why is that? because in those days they had the Soma. And we've made a few videos on the origin and nature of the Soma. And basically it is like the uh, psychedelic practices of the uh, tribal peoples in South America and other places around the world that uh, were not exposed to later developments in civilization. So they kept their original practices of using plant helpers, natural psychedelic drugs. And this research has only come out, you know, in the last 30 or 40 years from the field of ethnobotany. Ethnobotany is a scientific code word for going and hanging out with, and getting high with the natives. <laughs> It's a great excuse, huh? So they're going down in the Amazon, in South America, in Africa, and uh, tasting these natural substances uh, like ayahuasca, ibogaine, and so on, and peyote among the Native Americans, like that. And uh, then they're researching the history of it and the usage of it and so on. So, in the ancient Vedic days, they had Soma. And it's said about the Soma, for example, that even a common man who attends one of these sacrifices and partakes of the Soma could see the demigods and the god, Brahman, partaking of the remnants of the sacrifice or the offerings of the sacrifice. So that's a pretty strong psychedelic. Unfortunately, Soma has been lost. 
the secret of its ingredients, its preparation, and so on. All we have now are the rituals around it, the prayers and mantras and so on. So when that happened, then the upasana or vidyas were added to the basic sacrifice, the fire ceremonies, as a way of replacing the soma and getting the same or similar types of realizations from it. And gradually over time, the upasanas uh, became, first of all, optional, and then completely separate from the process of homa, fire ceremonies. And then uh, when, the, when the Buddha appeared 2,500 years ago, he pretty much divorced the whole process of meditation from the process of sacrifice. And in his teaching, it became its own thing, independent. Now, of course, historically, everything that Buddha taught has roots in the Vedas. You know, and it's interesting to see that even though the Buddhist culture has tried very hard to divorce itself from the Vedic context, now they're adding back in the same types of rituals, uh, making offerings and so on, but with Buddha as the god. Buddha would be shocked <laughs> if he came back and saw that. Maybe that's why they call him Shakyamuni. Oh, bad joke. <laughs> Shakyamuni refers to his clan, the Shakyas. But anyway, these meditations, collectively known as Vidya, now were superseded in the Puranas by upasanas of the different gods. Vishnu, Lakshmi, Shiva, Uma, Indra, and so on. And then even that was superseded by the Tantras later on, which said that even uh, material form, like a deity form, a temple deity, or even the name of one of these gods is a sufficient object for meditation. And it actually is. You know, Western people, materialistic people, don't understand the power of symbols. So even though the original upasanas, the original vidyas, were meditation on Brahman within the Aum or within the fire or as the Ananda Moya Kosha uh, and so on, but we're going to get into this in later episodes. Even so, when those were symbolized by the personalities or the, the imaginary metaphors of the different gods and goddesses, they still remain potent. And even when those were symbolized further, further abstracted by the tantras into the deity forms and even the names with the mantras, that they still remained potent. And why is that? How is it possible? If you practice it, you will see. And the reason is because of the chain of meaning. The chain of meaning always going back to Brahman. I'll give you an example. When I attained first path, 
back in 1984, I was doing the golden flower technique. And this is basically the upasana of uh, the mind, worshiping the mind as Brahman. Although at the time, I knew nothing about any of this. <laughs> I was just following an instinctive urge to simply sit down and watch. And after a few weeks of this, I got this tremendous illumination from Shakti herself. So by means of this technique, even though it's quite abstracted from the original, uh, I had no concept in those days of Brahman, except maybe a very sketchy one. Then what about the different mantras and stuff like that? Well, I've experimented with that too. And I found them to be efficacious. So in other words, the, uh, the various techniques that are given in the scriptures for meditation, even though they may be abstracted once or twice removed from the original, they still work. Maybe it takes a little longer. I'm thinking that's probably the case because I chanted Vishnu mantras for over 20 years before I sat down and meditated and got the result. Whereas uh, I think a person who sits down and meditates on, for example, fire or space or Aum as directly Brahman would get the result much quicker. The difference is one has to have faith. You can't expect to get any result if you don't have faith in the method. In Vedic culture, it was very easy or comparatively easy to have that faith because the leading members of society uh, were all exponents of Vedic knowledge and there were regular community festivals in which the fire ceremonies were held and so on and so forth. There were plenty of examples, plenty of context. But nowadays, you have to physically go to a temple to meet people who actually understand these things, have some feeling for it, have some faith in it. And by their association, maybe you can develop that faith. But anyway, now where the time is getting on here, uh, I wanted to talk about an experience I had last night where I got direction. So I had just eaten dinner, it was about six o'clock, nearly sunset. And I started to meditate. I was in my, in my bedroom, lying down on the bed. And I got a very strong, vivid image of Brahman. The silent, wordless, undifferentiated, brilliant, infinite consciousness. Uh, it's still very much fresh in my mind. Happened about 24 hours ago. And of course, this is accompanied by extreme detachment and bliss and great knowledge. So all this knowledge was flowing in and I got to see my life in a better perspective than I ever have before. And it was a timeless experience. It seemed like just a few minutes, but it was over an hour when I came out of it and looked at the clock. So Brahman was, I don't want to use, I had to say telling me, but letting me see, it's more like it. Because if you think of Brahman, if you meditate on Brahman, 
If you realize Brahman, you become like Brahman more and more until you finally identify completely with Brahman. So in that state, I could see very clearly how I was set up in this life, <laughs> karmically, that I had to look into all these things. I really, I couldn't have avoided it. I couldn't have escaped it. Even if I hadn't gone to India, it would have come to me wherever I was. So, you know, now I find myself nearly at the end of this life. And deep into the source literatures of the Vedic spiritual culture. And basically, uh, I got a message yesterday from one of the head monks, uh, Sanyasi, in the Divine Light Mission. And I, I was reading an article by one of his masters. And it said that these vidyas, these direct meditations on Brahman, are very powerful and potent. And even though the abstracted meditations based on them do work, it would be a great idea to revive the original vidyas on which they're based. So this I see as my mission. I already did one video on the practice of Ananda Maya Kosha. And I'm planning as part of the Vedanta series now to do uh, a series of videos on the different uh, vidyas and try to revive this practice or spread knowledge about it or somehow promote it in human society. This being the heartfelt wish of one of the senior sannyasis on the planet in the line of Shankaracharya. And uh, although I don't have much influence, I don't have many followers, uh, nobody really listens to what I say. <laughs> Maybe I can point a few people towards this powerful source of spiritual knowledge so that they can gain some of the greatest benefits that human life has to offer. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.